I have a dream. It's to have a dream. <laughs> that's that's that, good. Is that? I feel like that's on plagiarism, theme. though. It's on theme, no. but it's it's from a movie. Well, yeah, but it was you know speech first, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, no. I mean, yes and no. It's just, it's playing off of that speech. That's that's a good that's a good way. Also, I'll, it'll our intro will be some version of this. <laughs> I figured it was. That's perfect. That's perfect. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it's a dream within a dream, right? All it's right, great. Exactly. Perfect. <laughs> Welcome everybody to Afterthoughts. This is a podcast where we rewatch movies, we compare our first and second impressions, and discuss a related topic. My name is Joshua Kazemi, and I'm here with my co-host, Coleman Taylor. That's me. That's you. And today, <laughs> in honor of Dunkirk, uh, Dunkirk, I keep saying Dunkirk, and I don't know why. <laughs> it's Dunkirk. In honor of Dunkirk, Christopher Nolan's new movie, we're talking about Inception. Inception. <laughs> <laughs> it's my impression of the of the score. Yeah, and it's gonna come back in the episode in a big way. You'll see. <laughs> oh, um, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, before we talk about our first and second impressions, and I would say even before we talk about the plot, before you recap the plot, mm-hmm. um, should I start the podcast over right now? Yeah, just start from it here? over. Is this podcast so even happening? Do you know podcast within a podcast? Welcome everyone to Afterthoughts. <laughs> <laughs> We've officially started over. Exactly. And then at some point during this, you should then restart again. Yeah, we'll go one three, podcast. Three deeper. layers deep. <laughs> it's great. It's great. That's the most and ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I would suggest to our listeners, if you're listening, especially if you're listening on an Apple device in uh on apple podcasts you can slow us down to half speed or like even slower than that so every time we've restarted the podcast i think you should slow us down to really keep in theme with this movie yeah of course (laughs) except for only on that first one just slow down that first one don't ever slow down the second or third why not aren't you supposed to get slower every time you go in yeah but i guess we'll get into it in our second impression they only do Uh, slow-mo in the their the first one up they never oh go. Oh my gosh! They never go slow mo, and the Joseph Gordon Levin Levitt should have just been floating around in slow motion. Okay, <laughs> this is going to be a great episode. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take us through the plot. What's the plot of this movie? Uh, it's about <sighs> it's about dreams. Um, <laughs> it's a very expansive plot. So we op- <sighs> we open up with these guys who. You don't. Uh, you find out they're in a dream, trying to steal this ah. dude's information. Uh, it, but then it turns out they're in a dream within a dream, which is crazy. And then <laughs> they don't. They don't get the information from the guy, and it ends up costing them a lot because the company that wanted the info is now put a price on their head. So they're freaking out. And for some reason, Leonardo DiCaprio's character Cobb can't go back to America. You don't know why yet, though. Uh, but he really wants to see his kids. Um, and then a guy that they were doing this dream within a dream extraction thing with turns them in. Also, they're able to do this through an old government program. So they all hook up to this machine together. And that's how it's possible. But this guy tries to turn him over, ends up backfiring on him. And he's the one who gets captured. And they take in Leo and Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who is Arthur. Mm-hmm. And he wants them to incept a, a idea instead of extract it from a dream so they he wants them to put an idea into his competitor's son who's going to take over the company to break up his competitor's company essentially and they want to do this by going three dreams deep and pretty much manipulating this guy's relationship with his dad until he will ha- makes his own decision to break up the company and that's all I'm going to say. But this, there's so much more to this plot because it is yeah. so complicated and complex, whatever you want to <laughs> I didn't know how I was going to end that word, but I went it's with good. complicated. It's a very layered, complex movie. Yeah. It's like an onion. <laughs> so 
So, did you see this when it in 2010 when it came out? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I was super interested in this movie. Yeah. I remember seeing the trailer and just being totally sold. Like, I, I don't think I was super aware of who Christopher Nolan was in 2010. Like, it, I just didn't put two and two together that he was the guy who did Memento, which I had already seen, and the same guy who did, you know, the The Dark Knight and Batman Begins. I just was like, I saw the visuals in the trailer and the cast, and I was like, I need to see what this is about. Because <laughs> I don't think I don't think the trailer really gives much away either. It's not one of those bad trailers. It's just like an interesting visual thing. And it was like, I, I really want to know what's up with this movie. So I saw it and loved it. <laughs> yeah. I loved it my first time around, too. I don't think I was completely sold by the trailer. I can't remember exactly what I thought. I was interested, but I didn't think it was going to do that well. And then Mm -hmm. it was awesome. I loved it when I saw it. It was so cool. Just how literally how deep it goes. And then just (laughs) I loved all the layers when I first saw it. I was like, oh, this is so cool. Because I enjoy long movies, honestly. I mean, it depends on the kind of movie it is. But for this kind of movie, I enjoyed that it was long. And that it kept going further and further and just yeah. presenting more ideas. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. And the plot was pretty solid for how complex it went. Not perfect, but for all the ideas they were throwing at you, it's. I thought it was pretty solid. I thought it was, it was just such a cool idea. And I remember thinking like, gosh, like, of course, of course this is an idea. Like, how has no one done this movie yet i think they're probably like similar things but but a movie of this level of this caliber like i was so surprised that it hadn't been done before and it was so awesome like i i thought it was like expertly edited i was very impressed by the way the, the movies cut together and it, the execution of such a cool idea is awesome like even though it's it was pretty complicated and complex and plenty of moments where they're like explaining things to you. And honestly, like the first time I saw it, I'm positive that there were things that went over my head, you know, little, little details that, that just flew by me, but none of it mattered. Like it was so well paced and edited and put together that I like thoroughly enjoyed the movie through and through that first time. And I bought this movie like as soon as it came out (laughs) (laughs) because I wanted to watch it again and watch it again. So I've seen this movie so many times. And I love that it, it's such a unique idea and it works so well that they were able to pull it off because mm-hmm. I feel like most movies that have unique ideas are just seen by like a niche audience or not that popular or don't do that well or anything like that. But this one, because it was Christopher Nolan and the cast, it was just awesome to see them just completely make up this unique idea that doesn't really have any backing behind it and then pull it off and it's this really popular movie that a lot of people have seen and i think that's Mm -hmm. really cool that it's not like batman that obviously has a ton of fans already and has a comic book to back it or dunkirk which is still pretty unique but based on historical events it's just this really unique strange idea thrown out there and they went with it and pulled it off and i think that's awesome do you, before rewatching it this week, did you, what was your sort of, what did you think of the ending? Like, did you think it was real or not real? What was your stance? Uh, I just say real because I wanted it to be real. I like that. But not, I think he purposefully left it open to interpretation and, but just, I decided it's real because that's what I, why would I want it to not be real? That's silly. I've always looked at it like. Um, I, a, a, ti- a teeny tiny part of me is mad because I, I generally don't like it when filmmakers leave things ambiguous. I mean, it definitely depends. It's case by case, but, 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 but more often than not, I really like it when they commit to an idea and f- definitively say yes or no on something, uh, because it, I, I just like that, the courage in that, but, but it works really well. I think in this movie. Because because of what you just said, because people want it to be real, so they believe that it's real. And I think that speaks to the themes and the ideas of this movie. Like, you sounded a lot like Cobb just then. And I think that's part of it. That's definitely intentional. And this idea that an idea can consume you is also a very important thing in this movie. So it's just like people debating about it for seven years, I think is so, so cool that the movie can like do that to other people. Like the thing that's talked about in the movie then gets translated to its fans. 
they all are consumed by their opinion on whether or not it's real or not real. And they back it up with all these facts and evidence and stuff. It's like you, you've all have become Cobb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's awesome. And I also just think because of the material of the movie that it's, that it's about dreams and reality and what is real. So I'm more okay with there being an open ending on if this is real yeah. or not because of the material of the whole movie. That the whole movie is what is real and what's not. Mm-hmm. And so I'm more okay with it being open interpretation. And I will, I also enjoy in- open interpretation, I would probably say, more than you do. I like yeah. when there's not definitive answers. <laughs> well, it's a, it really depends. I like when there's definitive answers to most of the movie and then they leave some parts open for you to just interpret yourself. I do not like when just the whole thing is an into open interpretation to like the entire movie. I don't like that. It doesn't seem <laughs> like it seems to be art for the sake of art. And I don't, I don't sure. enjoy that. <laughs> so before I went to rewatch the movie, I was writing down my notes and I kept thinking like, is there a plot hole in this movie? <laughs> like at some point in seven years, have I thought about like a plot hole? And I feel like, I had, or I had talked to someone about it, like that there was some sort of, maybe not necessarily gaping, but just like there is something about it that doesn't make sense. And I mm-hmm. couldn't remember. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately like didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. And I was kind of looking for that in the rewatch. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you- I, I was positive this was going to hold up. I wasn't. I had no doubts. Well, I guess we're right on the cusp here. Uh, yeah. Well, did it hold up? And did you find what you were looking for? There are there are questions, I think. Um, things that you might have to explain away, and kind of. But I, I, think, I think for the most part, there aren't really any holes. I think it makes sense given, like, what it sets up. And I think this movie totally holds up. Okay. I like it a lot. <laughs> uh... I think there's one, I don't know if I'd call it a plot hole, but I would call it in, an inconsistent idea throughout the movie, and we can get to that. Oh, okay. Okay. <sighs> but did it hold up for you? Like, oh, that's a good question. Overall. overall, I will say yes, and I love it. But here's what brought me back a little bit. So we get to about, it was like right before they go into the third layer, and all I could think of was like, oh my gosh, this movie is so cool. I love it. It's <laughs> awesome. That's like all I could think. I was like, there are like a few things I like have against this movie and I don't even care. This movie is so cool. And then as soon as we get into the third dream, like more things started happening that I was like, mm. <laughs> and that kind of like took it, took me aback that I was so like, so on board with just saying, I love this movie. And then suddenly there's like just all these things that made it not as good. But I think even past all that, even past the third layer down, I still love it overall. I think it's a wonderful movie, and I mm-hmm. d- do enjoy it. Yeah. Absolutely. It just really stunk that I was, like, completely on board. Like, oh, this is so awesome. And then, like, a few things happened that I was like, oh, this kind of hurts how good it is. <laughs> but I think in the end, I gonna... still really don't care as much. Okay. Well, we got to get into that later on. Let's do for it. For sure. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> but well, uh, right out of the gate in the rewatch, I was so I, I kept thinking like, you know, this movie is great to rewatch and I've seen it so many times, but it wasn't until this this time that I was really able to articulate like this idea that it's so fun to rewatch because it starts with n- with not a ton of explanation and like uh, uh, specifically the scene where he washes up on the beach and talks to Sato like we have no idea what the context is or mm-hmm. what's going on it's just this interesting imagery in what you already sort of get a sense of is not like the real world no and i like that a lot and it's and it's interesting to rewatch it because you know exactly what the context is mm-hmm. like you come into it in a rewatch with all the answers to all these questions and so you're just sort of get, you just get like this full access pass to what's going on even like in the first hour or so of the movie when you don't know all of the context behind what's up with Cobb and why can't he go back to see his kids like you do know that in the rewatch and it's awesome you're like in on it with him and i like that experience a lot better like i feel like this movie more so than others is like groomed for rewatches i also absolutely love how information is slowly given to you over time Uh even though you see it the whole time even Uh right up front we don't i just love that in that opening scene i have no idea what's going on and 
they slowly start giving me stuff even in that first thing, but they're still slowly giving me information throughout the entire movie, whether it's about how the <laughs> dreams work, what's up with Cobb, what's up with all these people, and I love that. We don't even – because I'm sure people wondered, they're killing – his subconsciousness essentially. And we don't even find out, is that actually like damaging parts of his brain? And he's like, no, it's just projections. We don't find that out till very close to the end. And I just think it's crazy that they're still explaining that. And I think it actually really helps the movie overall because you don't just get, because this is a very exposition heavy movie and you don't just get it all at once. You get it in little pieces throughout the entire movie while experiencing it, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, gosh, there's so many cool things to talk about. I don't even know, I know. where to start. Like, Because <laughs> kind of what you were saying, like, one thing I really like about the movie is just, like, this attention, this commitment and attention to detail. Like, so so you eventually learn that Cobb can't go home because he, uh, people think that he killed his wife or he was responsible for it, right? Yeah. So what I like is that no one in this movie actually kills anyone. There's a lot of action, and mm-hmm. they kill a lot of projections, but the movie has constructed this way for our main characters to have action scenes, kill people, quote-unquote, but they're not actually c- killing anyone, and right. they're not actually harming any part of anybody's brain. I just thought, like, what an awesome way to get around that, to have main characters that you can root, can root for that aren't murderers. <laughs> you know, they're not the, the Fast and Furious crew. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not harming anyone, and it's <laughs> it's great. Yeah. And the the main time that idea came up for me was when he was running from Cobalt Engineering um, when he was getting Tom Hardy recruiting his character. Yeah. Because he's being chased by these guys. And at one point, I thought he had a gun in his hand. And I was like, oh, that's strange. But he didn't. And I thought, man, mm-hmm. I don't think he ever has a gun in real life. He just tries to avoid it. And even when he has a chance yeah. to kill someone who betrayed him, he doesn't. They only... Yeah. It's true. They only kill the projections and the dreams. And I did think that was really cool. And even... even like he does have a gun in the hotel room, um, and he he packs it into his bag when he and Joseph Gordon Levitt go up to the roof to and go up to the helicopter, the helipad or whatever. Right. So he does have a gun, but the fact that he never actually kills anyone in, in the real world is great. Yeah. Like the fact that he does have one but doesn't use it. Right. Uh, awesome. Attention to detail, really great thing. And like you were saying, also like. There is a lot of exposition, a lot of info dumps, but they're entertaining. Like they never, the movie doesn't ever halt so that we could explain something. Right. And there, there's like a clear point in this movie where things sort of take off. You know, once the team is assembled and they get into the dream, which is like what, an hour and a half in or something like that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a, it's a good chunk of the movie in. And that's sort of like this, this, when this, like the ball gets rolling, but there are still so many fun things that happen between the beginning of the movie and that point. It's not like this slow, slow build. It's this really fun, exciting build yeah. with with a chase scene when he's recruiting Tom Hardy and and uh, learning or Ellen Page learning how to construct dreams. Like all that stuff is really visually interesting and cool. And it happens before like the quote unquote starting point of the movie. Like that's that's good storytelling. That's that's constructing your your film very well. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. And it's that we experience the exposition. There's never just someone telling me something. Sure. I don't think hardly ever. Maybe one or two times. But usually when they're explaining the kick to me, they're actually showing someone being kicked. When they're explaining how disguises work in the dream, it's him slowly becoming a different person. And I've always heard this theory, never actually followed it or checked it out. Have you heard about his wedding ring at all? Oh, something. Yeah, what is it? It's totally, totally legit. He only wears his wedding ring in the dreams. He doesn't in real life. Oh, snap. That's awesome. And it's like legit. I paid attention the whole movie and 100%. And he's not wearing it in the end, if you're wondering. I like that. Spoiler for anyone who's listening to this podcast. Hope you've already watched it. It's real. It's all real. (laughs) It's all real. (laughs) Um, although you can only <laughs> really awesome. catch it in the airport because I tried to catch it like in the house when he's spinning the top and you like can't see his <sighs> left hand at all. But right, right. You can catch Could it falling asleep in the, airport. in the car on the way to jail. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's cool. But two things. OK, There's, these are the I think I've mentioned this to you, bef- this to you before. So sure. Maul kills herself from the opposite room of him. Always bothered me. Yep. And there, I'm. there's certainly got to be people below this building 
There's cars going. We can hear them. Someone had to have seen this man screaming from one window and this woman falling from another. He clearly like didn't murder her. I feel like there's yeah. got to be a witness. And yeah, that isn't that doesn't bug me too much, but it's it's a little loose. The thing that I it think, has. Yeah. Well, if you have something to say about it, you can. Well, well, I just wondered, like, it has always bothered me, but I've always wondered, like, maybe the circumstances still get him in trouble. Like, maybe she still made it seem as though there was, like, domestic violence or something, yeah. and and he, like, drove her to it or something. I don't know. I don't know. It has bothered me. But I guess, to your point, not not enough for me to dislike the movie in any real way. I think the thing that bugs me the most are the kicks. And I don't think uh-huh. they're that consistent because we sure. learn in the beginning of the movie and throughout most of the movie, the kick is in the dream above you. So it's not while it's happening right now. So it's when, so for example, in the first one, him and Joseph Gordon, let it Arthur and Cobb are in Saito's dream with him. And then, uh, Arthur wakes up first cause he gets shot and then says, give him the kick. And they kick him in the dream above where they're inside of like how like getaway place or whatever. Right. And kicks him and he wakes up later in the movie. Most of the kicks happen in the dream they're currently in. They have to jump out of limbo to get there. The kick from the dream above isn't enough. They actually have to fall in the dream they're in. And then another one is that Arthur doesn't wake up when he gets the first kick from the van above for some reason. I don't know how right. that's ever explained because he's still the one still awake and that first in the hotel dream. So that first kick should have woke him up. And there's just like tons of is- inconsistencies. Like, why does he have to blow up the hospital for them to be kicked at all? It should only be because of the dream above when the elevator crashes down. Well, that's true. That's true. I think if if the plan went as as it was supposed to. But, I th- but they always plan. They, they so did. They were always going to place the charges, I believe. Yeah, I think. I don't it, remember. I, I think it makes sense in the context that the movie as is because they had to go into limbo. But you're right; right. they always plan to do that, even if they weren't going to go into limbo. That was never the plan to go into limbo. So that's also true. is limbo just automatically the fourth dream down. You can't go three <laughs> because they don't kill each other to get to limbo. They go another dream right. deep. Yeah, and so does that automatically make it limbo? I don't know. I have to assume it does. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm confused about, I, I, I do think it's weird that he didn't, Joseph Gordon-Levitt didn't wake up when the, for the first kick in the van, right? Cause he should yeah. have. Right. He should have. I mean, it, but, it wouldn't make sense because he still has to save him, but yes, he should have woken up. But maybe I didn't ex- understand the way you, maybe I just didn't catch the way you explained it before, but it's, it's the van is the kick for the people in the hotel room. Minus Joseph Gordon-Levitt, so he should have woken up. And then, what's the kick under the hotel room? It's the, it's the, isn't it the snow place? Isn't that kick for the people in the elevator? That, they should, so if it went according to plan, the people in the snow place wouldn't have needed a kick. According to the logic in the beginning of the movie, because the elevator would have woken them up, and then the van would have woke them up in the layer above that, and then they just would have woke up in the airplane. <laughs> Just saying. I don't know. I think it's a little inconsistent, and I feel like someone forgot how kicks work halfway through writing the script, but (laughs) whatever. (laughs) That's the thing about Also, the van literally, like, does a 360 spin and no one wakes up? Okay. (laughs) Well, well, most of them are, are like, three dreams, two more dreams deep, right? Arthur should have woken up yet again. Arthur should have woken up, though. Yeah. He should have woken up, like, five times. (laughs) I guess. Is that is that right? I can't think it's of how you're right. wrong, but <laughs> it's interesting. It's because I'm right. <laughs> I mean, at the same time, I'm totally fine with it because this movie's awesome. But it yeah. just like it bugged me a little bit. Yeah, because it is something that comes in in the last hour of the movie, and I the movie, you know, I'm totally sold by that by then. Yeah, yeah, and I want to see how it plays out. At that point, I'm less interested in the logic of it all and more interested in where it's going as like this character driven action movie. Like I want to know what's going to happen with Cobb. That's kind of my whole, my whole deal. Yep. By that point. Yep. Another thing. Well, but while we're on Arthur, Mm -hmm. does the research thing like totally like bother you? (laughs) 
what thing? The... <laughs> His job is to do research, and he didn't know that that Killian Murphy's character uh, was like equipped to deal with extraction, and he had like <laughs> weaponized uh, projections. I don't know. I Arthur gets mad at someone else for not researching either, and I feel like both the things they're supposed to research are things that couldn't be found out anyway. So it, I don't know. Because the first one is that guy doesn't know his rug is made of a different material. Right. Also, Cobb says, don't make places you know. So why was their choice to make completely redesign a room that not only all of them know, but the main dude knows too? I know it was to kind of intimidate him, but Cobb literally said, don't make places you know. Yeah. And maybe that's why he did. Yeah. Maybe that moment in the movie is what made him decide to say that later. Slash, they make a point that he does things he says not to do all the time, but I thought that was silly. Yeah. <laughs> but no, the the fact that I think that them getting angry at not researching these people so thoroughly that we don't find this extremely secret part, I feel like it's silly that they get mad at them for that. All right. How's that well, dude going to know that? that it's an emotional not- moment. Like, they're all kind of freaking out. I, I totally buy it as, like, maybe not the oh, most yeah, logical yeah, yeah. thing to do. But, I, like, from an emotional standpoint, I get why they're all so mad. But from, like, an audience perspective, I've always – that line of that exchange is, like, I'm sorry. It should have come up in the research. Like, that's kind of – it feels a little bit like, like, let's just get past it. Just move past it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, but it's – Yeah. Never has never ruined the movie for me again. Like nothing really has. I have a list of stuff. I have like three things that I did think about that still really don't mess the movie up for me. Like no. this idea that like there is a lot of exposition, but we never really get too bogged down in the specifics of what's possible and how things work in the dreams. Like, mm-hmm. like, like what is building the dreams? What is what is the process of that? Is it just sleeping and creating in your sleep, or or is 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 she designing things in in the real world and then sort of taking them with her into the dreams? Because at one point there are like models and stuff, right? No. Yeah. So I don't know. Like, but I get on. We don't need that. But then again, it does leave a lot of questions. Like, why can't they just fly around in the dreams or have <laughs> superpowers? You know. Yep. Like, it's a dream, and you're lucid dreaming. Can't you do anything? <laughs> and that that was one thing that I also thought of, specifically when she uh, Cobb is, like, testing her and her abilities. At one point, she randomly just grabs mirrors out of nowhere. Yeah. They have no reason to be there in real life, moves them into place, and then breaks them and makes a completely new construct. And it while they do cool dreamlike things, like no gravity and all kinds of things like that, they, they really... I've wish they did tap more into, Hey, this is a dream and I can do whatever I want. Obviously they have to have limitations on that. Yeah. But especially when the dreamer finds out he's dreaming, like the person they're trying to, <laughs> uh, incept, there's no more cause to like, Oh, we can't let him find out he's dreaming. Yeah. So I wish they had played a little bit more of, Hey, this is a dream and it's one of our dreams. We can do whatever we want. I wondered if maybe it was like, you know, Arthur says that, this was developed by the government to allow soldiers to to fight each other and, and and train in that way without actually harming one another. So I'm I'm wondering if maybe shared dreaming through this device grounds the dreams a little bit in reality in order for them to ex- like experience more of a realistic combat right scenario. But I wish it. That's exactly what I wish it was though. Like grounded fantasy i guess so you're not just flying you're not just doing whatever you want but exactly what they did in the earlier ones even i don't even think her flipping the world isn't that grounded and i would say even less than that yeah just like the example of her grabbing that mirror and breaking it i wish there were more things like that it's not that far out there but it's clearly something you can't do in real life Mm -hmm. and i wish there were just a few more of those another thing that i had was um when how does how does Cobb end up on the beach like in that opening scene that we revisit later, he he was in the apartment with Ma and then the next time we see him in limbo he's on the beach face down he's in double down. limbo it just keeps going <laughs> he does get stabbed by it's Ma it's true he does so is it double limbo I don't it's not right that's not a thing. I think it's just another part of limbo I don't know 
I don't, don't know. know how limbo works. But how does he end up like? It, it seems as though a lot of time has passed, and I guess it has because Sato's Sato's really old. How are you saying that? Yeah, I can't remember. He's super old, but but Leo isn't, and mm-hmm. he washes up on the beach. So I'm wondering if it's a time jump. But even if it is a time jump, why isn't Leo older? Yeah. Also, why are Leo and why are Cobb and Maul really old at one point? But then when we see them actually deciding to kill themselves and go back to real life, they're young again. That also doesn't make sense to me. Mm. Can you control your age in here or not? I don't I don't know. I don't I actually don't know. know. And then this one. I might need to think through this one. So, <laughs> so Sato is trapped in limbo because he died, right? He died mm-hmm. in the snow level. He was dying yep. in all of them and died in the snow level. So he was trapped. That's why they had to revive... Killian Murphy, I forget his character's name, <laughs> the son. Um, yeah. So that's why they had to revive him, and that's why Ellen could jump off the building and just wake up in the next level. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. I wonder what would have happened if they couldn't revive him. Couldn't revive the Fisher? the son. Yeah, Fisher. Yes. I think no matter what, they could revive him. I think as long as you get a kick from the one be- below and you're doing something to bring them back. Huh. To that level specifically. I don't know. That's a tough one. Yeah. I don't know. And then there is that moment where we don't see how Sato and Leo get out of the dream. I guess just t- enough time has passed and the sedative is worn off. And that's co- that's sort yeah. of intentional so that they set up the end of the movie as you don't know if it's a dream or not. But yeah. yeah. I don't know. And I mean, they he killed himself before to get out of limbo, which I don't understand how that gets you out of limbo. But I mean, they didn't have a sedative that time. I think that was what it was. I get. Oh, that's true. How'd okay. they get to Limbo in the first place then? They just kept going deeper? I guess so. I don't know. I don't know. All right. few other things for <laughs> me, though. This isn't really a killer. I just kind of think I wish each one had been a little longer or they just didn't have one more level because this movie's already very long. But I've always been kind of disappointed that we're in these really cool worlds that they've developed. And then I understand that we have to suddenly put a time essence on. But I hate that it went from one week slash six months slash ten years to, (laughs) oh, we've got to do this as fast as we can. And not only that, she builds a labyrinth in her third one. And then they end up just skipping through it. Like there's no... It doesn't even matter that she built a maze. They have to get to the end as quick as possible. And that's always kind of bugged me. I wish they would have spent a little more time in each one. And that means cutting off the last one. I don't know. It would have been a different movie because mm -hmm. it's so important that they have three. I don't know how to get around this one, but I've just always felt like a tinge of disappointment in spending so little time in each of these places when it's like we're building these awesome places where you can do so many things. Yeah, I, it sounds to me like your version of this would be like a novel that that mm-hmm. spends chapters in, in each level and really experiencing what they have to offer. But in right. in the, in a movie version of it, I, I I understand why there has to be like a quote unquote ticking clock, you know, to keep right the drama of it uh, like going. Because if I you really slowed it down to ten years, I think it would alleviate a lot of the tension. Oh yeah, yeah, and I wouldn't want it to be ten years either. And I understand why they have to... I mean, that's where a lot of the suspense of the movie comes in. And uh, I mean, there's so many places, Cobb's Mm -hmm. backstory and stuff. But a lot of it really does come from, we've got to do this quickly, even though we thought we had a lot of time. And I understand that, but I still think it's disappointing to have this really cool concept of, we can build these awesome places and do all of these things, and then now we have to go through them as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. I get why... it. I get it for the plot... It's just, it really is disappointing that you have this awesome concept and can't fully flesh it out and see everything you can do with it. Hmm. Yeah. This bugs me about the main people is that they're, I understand why he has to do what he has to do, but I hate that they're legitimately doing illegal activities and they even try to make up for it at one point. Saito's rationale behind breaking up his competitor's company is that they're about, they're on the verge of monopolizing world energy or something and so they're going to become the next superpower if we don't break it up and there's just that small little bit of like good moral behind what they're doing but other than that it's literally just to break up someone's competitor so they can like 
monopolized before they do essentially. And then on top of that, that everything is fake that they get this son to believe his father wants him to be his own man and yeah, go make his own company. And it's not real at all. Completely not. You can assume from the way the movie was set up, his father really did not believe in him at all. And that is so sad to me. That is pretty sad. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I, I honestly like to me, this is no one else's story but Cobb's. Like, yep. not even like supporting characters. I think he's the main character, and everybody else is just like there to serve him. I agree. In the context, although of I movie. still like the surrounding cast, absolutely. Uh-huh. Everybody's but great. It is his story. It's not an uh, what is it? An uh, entourage? I can't even. <laughs> an ensemble. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I knew that wasn't right, it is but it's not all that came to mind, and I could not. <laughs> I was like, he has an entourage, but <laughs> that's not what it is. He does. There's the there's the moment towards the end of like the planning, you know, montage or whatever, where they're like, you know, they're talking about they're trying to figure out when is a long enough time for them to pull this off, and they come up with the the airline thing, but they're on like these steps in a dream, <laughs> like <laughs> you know, like they're on a photo shoot or something. I kept thinking like, why do you need to be in the dream to talk about some of this stuff? <laughs> you know yeah you just yeah. are in dreams right now <laughs> right it's pretty funny i guess time management like we're gonna have a five minute meeting but really it needs to be like three hours long we'll just do it in the yeah. dream <laughs> that's pretty funny also time passage to this and this doesn't make sense to me either <laughs> because we find out that 10 seconds in that van world equals an hour in the snow world that's a lot of hours. I feel like they had a long time. <laughs> but I digress. I feel like I've bashed on this movie that I said I loved in the beginning. And I really do. Despite all those things I've said, those are it's, very specific points yeah. that I like found. Overall, this movie, I think, is brilliant, honestly. Yes. I think they took a really hard idea and concept to put on the big screen and then flesh out. And I think despite the like minuscule plot holes if you'll even call them that i'm not even sure they're that i think they pulled it off really well just i was so pulled into this movie by the second layer and even still through the third where the third is where most of the like flaws showed for me i would say but all the way through i would say i was really invested in this movie and drawn by Cobb's story by the idea of these dreams even the the cool concepts they do pull off, because I know I said I wish they did more dreamlike things. They can do whatever. But Joseph Gordon-Levitt floating around in gravity fi- with zero gravity yeah. while fighting guys is awesome. Mm-hmm. That was so cool. The first time I saw it, I still love it. Mm-hmm. And I love everything they do. I think despite these little things, it was a hard idea going in, and they knew it wasn't going to be perfect. And going on with that, I'd say that this movie is awesome. I totally agree. It's It's a brilliant idea. And, you know, I just, I really love all of the character work that is going into this Mm -hmm. movie. Like, it's not just a cool, interesting idea that will translate to this great visual masterpiece. It's, it's a visual masterpiece accompanied with great character motivating stuff. Like Mm -hmm. the, the whole, the whole thing suits, suits the themes and ideas of the story. Like the fact that this is like the dreams allow for this physical representation of a man experiencing grief and guilt because he's, he's quote unquote haunted by the memory of a loved one. And it's through these dreams. It's not, you know, it's not flashbacks. It's not an old video recording. It's not a ghost. It's not a letter that the main character has always had, but has never opened until he's ready to, you know, (laughs) for for the climax to overcome it and read the note from a lost loved one or whatever. Like, (laughs) The movie has constructed a way for this character to deal with grief and guilt in a new and interesting way. It's awesome. And then I mentioned it a little bit in the first impression, but the idea that this movie is about inception, it's what they're trying to do, but it's also what is crippling the main character at the same time. Mm -hmm. That he's consumed with an idea, the guilt of killing his wife, because he made her consumed with an idea. (laughs) It's it's awesome. It's literally three inceptions in the movie, in a movie about three dream layers. It's and and just that attention to detail. He's so convinced early on that Inception is real. And he's mentioned he's done it before, but you don't 
like fully grasps the gravity of how much mm-hmm. he knows Inception is real. And I thought th- this was the first viewing where I really like felt the gravity of that reveal when you reveal because you kind of get inklings that he incepted Maul, but what he actually did, how convinced he was early on of, oh, Inception's real. It can definitely happen. And how it plays out of how he knows. It's amazing. Yeah. But on top of just the serious uh, character development and the plot he's going through, his own personal struggle, I don't think that bogs it down either. Because it is a kind of depressing story for him. But you have all these supporting characters, while and while they don't have their own character arc necessarily they all bring this really fun aspect to the movie and i think even though it's got this kind of dark character arc for the main character it's surrounded by all this like fun moments and overall fun characters i would just say that's how i would describe the surrounding cast Mm -hmm. and i really enjoy that i'm glad it doesn't get bogged down and isn't just this serious uh character study and cool idea but it's also really fun it's not it doesn't just have a serious aspect. It's so good. <laughs> I keep talking about this movie, but I feel like <laughs> we've just hit we've hit so many points. Yeah. <laughs> we can it's move on. It's really good. It's to really, some, really good. Yep. We can move on to some Twitter feedback. Let's do it. All right. So I tweeted out a poll about uh, uh, Inception and our our great listeners and Twitter followers were, were here to answer. Um, so I wrote, next week we're talking about Inception in honor of Dunkirk. What do you think of Inception? Uh, option one was, Brom. <laughs> <laughs> I see it came back in a really yep. big way. There you go. Option two is uh, ruining trailers since 2010. Because <laughs> every trailer since then has been, Brom, Brom. <laughs> <laughs> option three is A or B, parentheses, pole within a pole oh my gosh yeah and (laughs) finally our last option is great flick that's simply just great flick (laughs) so let's go through some of these results 20 percent said brahm which is great happy with where that landed another (laughs) another 20 percent for ruining trailers since 2010 five percent for a or b which you know i was sad about but i get it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and 55 percent of people said great flick yes awesome yeah which is great <laughs> what a good percentage it is it is and then we got some feedback from the poll which is great um spencer scott holmes replied i enjoy anything christopher nolan though i'm done with seeing dunkirk tra- uh, uh, the dunkirk trailer with every movie in the last six months <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can get on board with that yeah and a lot of people did so <laughs> <laughs> awesome <laughs> and then someone else uh responded i think it's i think it's titany at titany uh in french said uh i don't want to read it in french i took french a long time ago but i can't do it anymore she <laughs> said or he said i don't know um i love it but i can't vote because i don't understand <laughs> That's probably, you know, it's a confusing poll. <laughs> well, I'm glad you gave it your best shot. Yeah. Thank you for tweeting. <laughs> it's great. Well, I think this is a perfect moment to uh, stop the podcast again. Maybe it's too late for that. And start it over for a third time. To- no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, we can go great. to topic time. That's great. Yeah, let's do it. Topic time. So what are we talking about today? Christopher Nolan, the man, the director, the producer, the writer. (laughs) (laughs) The man, the myth, the legend. (laughs) There it is. All right. So, man, I just want to open with this. Okay. So people, everyone, everywhere, including us on this podcast several times, we all clamor for original content. And here's the man that has consistently given it to us for a decade, for more than that. This is the guy. (laughs) This is the guy. Huge, big, original content. It's awesome. He get he gets he's a really well respected director. I think he deserves even more than that. Yeah, I love Christopher Nolan. Mm -hmm. I think he's fantastic. I don't even know what more to say than that. He (laughs) knows how to make great movies. He knows how to make 
great original content, and he also knows how to take all, like content that's come before him and make it look, make a new twist to it, put his own ideas into it. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. What is your favorite Christopher Nolan? Movie? Yeah, well, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking we could go through the list and then get into that for sure. All right. So in '98, his his feature film debut was called uh, a movie called The Fall, or no, just Following. No article. Following. Mm-hmm. I've never seen it. Have you? Nope. Apparently, it's pretty short. I think it's like an 80 minute, 90 minute movie. It's got some shorts before that, right? But that's uh-huh. his first feature length. Yeah. And then Memento, which I think was the the big one. Mm-hmm. Great movie. The movie's awesome. I remember, let me, I, honestly, like the first time I saw it, it came out in 2000. I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it. I was way too young I to didn't understand get it. that. I didn't understand. Uh, but in a rewatch years later, great. Awesome. It was so cool. <laughs> um, yeah. And then Insomnia, I never, I didn't see that. I didn't see that either. I think that might be the, the, the following and Insomnia are the only two I haven't seen. I've seen all the rest, I'm pretty sure. Because we got, we got Batman Begins after that, The Prestige, The Dark Knight, <laughs> Inception, The Dark Knight Rises, Interstellar, and then Dunkirk. And he wrote Man of Steel. Oh, oh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> i always forget about that yeah that, that that's kind of that that connection yeah my brain but just blocks it out so many of my top movies are on his list yeah it's amazing interstellar is way up there obviously if you've listened to this episode you know inception's way up there at this yep. point yep yep the dark knight all of those batman movies really even if they're not perfect i still love all of them and would watch i'd watch all three again yeah also it's been a long time since i've watched all three which mm-hmm. is kind of why i want to memento probably isn't one of my favorites but it's definitely really good and yeah. an awesome concept it's just really like cool. we've been talking about if you had to pick though number one i think it's inception oh it's tough <laughs> for me it's real tough i mean inception or the dark knight i don't know i really love those two it's definitely one See, of my those thing- two My thing with The Dark Knight, and I think it'd be great for the podcast for this reason, I think The Dark Knight had a wonderful performance, obviously, Heath Ledger, the Joker, but I'm not sure the overall plot and story is as solid as the rest of his. Yeah. I I think the Joker in that movie really shined and made it iconic for what it is, and watching him is one of the best experiences in the film you can ever see. But I don't think the plot in that movie is going to be as solid as Inception or Memento or Interstellar or any of the others. Yeah, I agree. Like um, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about Spider-Man and all the different Spider-Man movies. And I think it's similar. Like, I don't know if we've ever gotten a really great characterization of Batman. Um, I think I think maybe we've been close and there have been great Batman movies for sure, like really awesome mm-hmm. movies. But this idea of Batman as a detective, like just the simple thing, like when you're describing Batman, that's the first word you use. He's a detective. And I don't think yeah. we've gotten that to a, uh, the fullest extent. And I think we get close in the Nolan movies. But yeah, I think I think The Dark Knight is this great movie with Batman in it. And it's not, it yeah. doesn't feel like a great Batman story. But even not just Batman story, but overall, the whole plot, mm. I'm pretty sure I remember it being kind of loose, <laughs> but the Joker just, he brings it home. Yeah. It's, it's like just showing him over and over and like, look how awesome this is. And he, it really, it works. <laughs> I love that movie. Even, it, and usually I don't like when plots aren't solid, but I, that one scrapes by because yeah. it's so good. Because the, the pencil on the table is the Dark Knight, and the Joker's kind of taking our head and forcing it in. It's like, this is <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and you're going to like it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's a great movie. I, I mean, it on. might be Interstellar for me, though. I really think okay. it comes close. That makes sense. I mean, I, I mean, Inception's on the mind right now, so I do honestly want to say Inception, but I think overall, Interstellar's probably it. Mm-hmm. It's a great movie. And it, you know, Interstellar is great because I think it, of all of his movies, I think it, it's the coolest one to, when you consider that, that Christopher Nolan has committed to, 
shoot only shooting on film. He doesn't shoot digitally. And he loves practical effects. So the fact that he has this epic space opera almost, you know, is is mm-hmm. great when it's all shot on film and it's all it's mostly practical. And it and it's a beautiful movie, both yeah. visually and some might argue plot wise as well. <laughs> 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 Obviously not you. I don't know. I'd go back and forth. <laughs> I, know. I feel like all of his movies kind of have that in it, though. Just a little bit of like mm, on the plot. Yeah. Like l- little gaps here and there. But I think it's because he tries to make these expansive movies that are mm-hmm. just so grand. And so, of course, it's going to have like little holes you can poke here and there. Some bigger than others. Yeah. And I think that just comes with his style of movie making. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, we... I. We both agree they're fantastic movies, so they really it works. Are. <laughs> so uh, we did an episode on Interstellar a while back, and mm-hmm. I think I even mentioned it in that episode that there was something I wanted to bring up later, and I didn't, and it's always bothered me. Um, so I'll bring it up now because it it's relevant. Uh, in that movie, and I think in other movies, I think primarily the the Batman movies. Nolan does this thing where I don't think it happens in Inception, but he shoots large chunks of the movie with IMAX cameras and the rest are sort of whatever other camera he uses, like another film camera. And the aspect ratio on the screen changes. Like it's a full frame when they're IMAX and it's this letterbox when it's not. And honestly, like it's such a nitpicky thing and I don't really even, it, it like doesn't really take away from the movie. It's like only in the rewatches have I ever realized that it happens. Like I remember the first time I caught it in the dark night and I was like, whoa, the, the aspect ratio changed. <laughs> it's really weird. Now it's a full screen and now it's back to letterbox. Why is it doing that? And it's because he shoots the bigger image on IMAX and he wants you to see the whole thing instead of sort of cropping in that letterbox mode. But it's like... I, I don't know of any other real director or not real directors. I don't know of any other directors who do that or any that are like at his status who, who do that. It's just a weird thing. I don't know if you, if anyone notices that. Yeah. I was about to say, I don't think the sentence, well, the aspect ratio changed will ever come out of my mouth because <laughs> it's something I'll never notice. <laughs> I Rewatch think that's just interstellar, the, the man. Curses. It happens all the time in interstellar. See, I don't, I would never notice unless you point it out, and then I'd probably notice forever. It's like I think that's probably just your curse of being <laughs> a radio, television, film person. <laughs> it's the full frame for a lot of it, and then all of a sudden, or it's kind of reverse. It's the letterbox for most of it. It's this cropped frame, and then it's the full frame for the IMAX shots, or like yeah. those shots in the beginning with the documentaries being cut th- in and out, like with the people talking about farming mm-hmm. or whatever those are full yeah. frame if i remember correctly and then the rest of the movie is this letterbox with the black bars on the top and bottom and it's like why is it change <laughs> it's so <laughs> weird <laughs> oh, see there's been so many times when we're doing this podcast and you'll bring up these visual things i'm like nope didn't notice it <laughs> don't, don't even know what you're talking about right so now strange did you notice this really cool shot they got nope <laughs> but i can talk to you about the plot all day <laughs> It's like the one thing I bring to this podcast. It is a, it is a bit of a curse. That's <laughs> true. Oh. <laughs> and another gripe I have, it's a joke. I'm just going to preface it. It's a joke. It's not a real gripe. But <laughs> every one of his movies has been released on an even-numbered year, except for Dunkirk. Ruins it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's probably going to be terrible. Wow. How dare you put that curse on him? <laughs> I'm also lying. So it's most of them. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not even telling the truth. No, no, it's most of them. The only one that was odd was the was Batman Begins in 05. But starting in 06, he put one out every other year until yeah. Interstellar. He stopped. So it was like 06, 08, 10, 12, 14, and now 17. Uh, he wrote Man of Steel. Doesn't count. You keep forgetting <laughs> that. Doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> the title of this topic time is going to say Director Christopher Nolan. I don't care about anything else. <laughs> wow. <laughs> thought you were a writer guy and you only care about directors. <laughs> Man. Oh, I was going to say, I, I think at one point in the podcast, uh, I missed the, I, I forgot or whatever. That's the thing. Of, that's one of the interesting things about Christopher Nolan is that he writes a lot of his movies with a small team 
And so they never, I, from from my understanding, they don't go through the, the normal script processes of like a writer bringing it to the studio, collaborating with the director, going through drafts, and then shooting. Like Christopher, I, I remember a TA in college telling me like Christopher Nolan just writes whatever he wants and then they shoot it. Because he's got like the the respect and the weight to just do kind of whatever he wants to do. <laughs> yeah. I remember getting like the first page of the Dark Knight script, and there's like this at the top of the script. There's like in the script, not even the title page. There's like it says the Dark Knight in this like crazy font, and it's spaced out throughout the whole page. And it's like you know the whole deal is that every script is the same font. It's that same font. It's that same format. <laughs> <laughs> but Christopher yeah. Nolan was like, it's my script, it's my movie, I don't care. We're gonna do fancy <laughs> font for the title on the on page one. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. I've also heard rumors that like the man doesn't like prep anything. That he just kind of shows up and he's like, These are the shots I think I want, and let's do it. <laughs> and I don't know if that's true. That seems insane. Like, yeah. how could you do that with million dollar movies? I mean, if it's true, though, that's highly impressive. Yeah, crazy. Is it weird? This feels very Inception-y. Every time we've talked about, like, since we've decided, hey, let's do Inception for Dunkirk, I've constantly felt like we've already done Inception in this podcast. Is that weird? <laughs> <laughs> it's very weird. <laughs> appropriate. Am I dreaming? Is this real? Are we even doing know. it right now? I, I don't know. know. I don't know. <laughs> No, but seriously, there are multiple times I'm like, I I feel like we've already done Inception. Like, I feel like it's one we've already done. <laughs> and we have not at all. I'll even go back and check occasionally. I'm like, it's got to be in there somewhere. I'm it's so really convinced. Isn't. I've been Incepted. <laughs> Leo, you did it again. That's amazing. That's all I got, though. Christopher Nolan's great. great. All of his movies. Yeah. I'll keep, I'll go see Dunkirk. It's not even really my cup of tea, but I, you made it. I'll go see it. Yeah, absolutely. I'll see anything that he does so that he can keep doing his thing. Yep, yep. He deserves all of our support. <laughs> well, I think that's the show. All right. Well, halfway through this ending, I'll try to stop and end it again. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening. You're great. We really appreciate it. If you want to keep supporting the podcast, keep the keep the lights on, as they say be great if you could share this podcast with a friend and then share it with them again and then be like i didn't never share this with you before this is the first time i'm doing this <laughs> <laughs> you know just, just do that accept a lot. it right in there perfect <laughs> that'd be awesome and it'd be great if you could uh, write us a review in itunes that's another great thing and uh keep uh, keep tweeting at us answer the polls tweet at us we'll read your tweet on the podcast if we if we can and that'd be great so uh yeah next week is a bonus episode so tune in for that bonus going off the beaten path every 10 weeks or so we do a bonus episode i don't think we plan that but it just happens every 10 weeks <laughs> <laughs> so it's about that time yep. <laughs> so tune into that it's gonna be great it should be fun and uh yeah we'll see you we'll see you next week yep, see y'all thanks bye